Our guests today are Kerry Burke, a partner of Covington and Berlin here in Washington, D.C., Kathy Clarkin, a partner of Sullivan and Cromwell in New York City, and Mark Gentile, who's a director of Richard's Laden and Finger in Wilmington, Delaware. I'm Brock Romanek, today on Zippy Point. The legal aspects of virtual meetings. So last year caught everyone, of course, by surprise with the pandemic coming in the midst of the proxy season. A number of companies had virtual meetings, but in reality, they had a few people in headquarters in the company's offices as the in-person meeting, and then they happened to webcast it. They assured there might be a change in that process because companies have more time to plan to know there's a pandemic now. But it'll be interesting to see. So we brought our panel of legal experts. Thank you so much. We have quite a, an impressive agenda. This is a record number of agenda items for any panel I've ever done in my career. So thank you to Carrie, Mark, and Kathy for doing this. So the first question, Mark, is about the bylaws. What, what do you have to consider for your, your bylaws when it comes to virtual annual meetings? Well, the first thing uh, that we would look at is both the certificate of incorporation and bylaws to confirm that there is nothing in either of them that would restrict the company from having a virtual meeting. So if they're silent uh, and there are no restrictions, then the company is free to go ahead and have a virtual meeting. It is at this point uh, unusual in our experience to find things uh, in already existing bylaws that would restrict the ability to have one, but it's incumbent on the company to make sure there's nothing in there that could be used to challenge the validity of the bylaw, um, first and foremost. And then uh, one would need to give thought to who's going to run the meeting. This is where the traditional provision of bylaws uh, delegating, for example, to the, either to the chairman of the board or somebody else, the ability, ability to be the chair of the meeting. And because this is, uh, for many companies, a, a new venture, we would strongly encourage that they have a practice run with the person running the meeting as the chair to make, because they're remote, and instead of being on a dais with people in visible sight, to ensure that the remote participation by the chair and the others at the meeting uh, work as smoothly as they would if it were actually an in-person meeting. And then Kathy, when it comes to the press release last year, again, it was a last minute adventure for many companies. So the press release was important. What about this year? What changes might there be? I think it really depends on whether or not companies will know in advance whether they're having a, a virtual meeting or not. I expect many companies, if they do have a virtual meeting, We'll know that in advance and it'll be in their proxy materials. So over the past year, what happened was, you know, people were switching kind of in the midst of they'd already filed their proxy materials and the SEC came out with very helpful guidance that said, you've already filed your proxy materials, you can change the format of your meeting by issuing a press release. And that press release had to say a couple of things, obviously, the logistics of where the meeting was being held, how shareholders could participate, who could vote, who could attend, all of those logistics. So if a company is in that you know, phase next year where they actually have filed their proxy materials and they are planning on doing a physical meeting and then all of a sudden need to change, they would be able to do so assuming the SEC guidance would still apply and I expect it would, they would need to issue a press release. And I think what's going to be important this year is that it needs to be very clear, it needs to be shareholder friendly. So there are some additional things that I think companies will add to this press release which will include, you know, allaying their concerns that this will limit their participation. So being very clear on, you know, how Q&A will work, um, whether questions can be submitted in advance, whether there'll be a replay of the meeting, things of that nature. And just like last year, if a company does use a press release, they would file it as additional proxy solicitation material. Yeah, and some of the other uh, big guides I've made about virtual meetings, it's very clear that investors, the institutional investors are really important about how you're going to be running the meeting, including that Q&A. So I, I completely agree with you. It's good to look for examples, best to breed press releases and try to draw ideas from those as about what you might want in the press release. So Mark, what about the official meeting notice? What kind of language about virtual meetings is, is important for that? Well, there are statutory requirements, and then there are, are elements, I think, that we would recommend in light of uh, entering into the virtual meeting uh, aura, if you will. First, um, uh, the date and time of the meeting uh, have to be specified in the notice, uh, the agenda items, the website address uh, for the virtual meeting, and then we would recommend um, that the company does indicate up front where the stockholder list can be viewed you know, right in the notice of meeting. So for example, 
many companies, uh, even with virtual meetings, have still maintained the stockholder list at company headquarters, you know, even during the uh, pandemic. However, during uh, a virtual meeting, the stock list needs to be open for examination on a virtual platform. And that also should be indicated in the notice of meeting itself. So uh, statutory requirements, date, time, website, and then where shareholders will be able to uh, take a look at um, the list of stockholders for the meeting. And this list of stockholders is just registered owners. Of course, the company doesn't have a list of their beneficial owners uh, itself, so they, they can't share anything like that. Correct. And then, Kerry, what about the proxy disclosure? I have a separate big guide that it shows the Southern Company's uh, disclosure about the virtual meeting that they held, had last year. I find, found that to be one of the best dis, uh, set of disclosures I've seen about virtual annual meetings. But w what do you think the proxy should say about the mechanics of the meeting? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, this is really an opportunity for companies to up their game, um, as Kathy mentioned from last year. And so in the proxy, you're gonna wanna have disclosure about the logistical details on you know, how a stockholder can view and participate in the meeting, how they can join, um, how they can ask questions, which obviously was a big hot button um, with investors in last year's proxy season, and I expect will continue to be this year. Um, how they go about voting, the actual mechanics of it, if they have any control number issues um, or how they go about getting their control number. And then also if they have any technical difficulties, how do they get those resolved? You know, is the company gonna have a website or a phone number that they can call during the meeting? And I think it's really important that um, companies spend a little time thinking about how to make this very accessible to shareholders, to put it into plain English, so that people will have a really good roadmap of the rules of the road um, for uh, navigating a virtual shareholder meeting. And then I'll just note, um, this isn't really a legal requirement, but Glass-Lewis um, recently updated its policy guidelines. Its policy on virtual stockholders meeting is very similar. Um, I think probably identical to what it was last year. Um, but they said that you know they're really expecting very robust disclosure around um, how a virtual stockholder meeting effectively approximates an in-person meeting. So how is a company giving the same rights and opportunities to stockholders that it would if it was having an in-person meeting? And so um, having disclosure around things like Q&A or if the company is going to um, post all the Q&A afterwards on an, an investor website, um, if they're having logistical issues or technical issues, technical support, I think those things will all be really important to address from a proxy advisor perspective as well. And Glass-Lewis has said that if those types of disclosures aren't sufficiently robust enough in the proxy, that it will um, recommend against um, governance committee members um, this year. So something to, I think, think about for, for a couple of different reasons in terms of bolstering and beefing up that disclosure. Yeah, one of the byproducts of the pandemic is that there's actually a heightened attention being paid to the annual meetings. It's really interesting, you know, like uh, unforeseen consequence. Um, and of course, the SEC doesn't have disclosure requirements about what you need to disclose about the mechanics of your annual meeting. That's something that, that companies do voluntarily because they have to inform shareholders how to attend, of course. The one, uh, one thing that we've always advocated is even more important now is that you know, the card itself say, you know, or any adjournment or postponement thereof, because then that will kind of pick up what, and we're going to talk about adjournments a little bit. And the one thing we have um, seen grown carry is, is just the disclosure in the proxy statement about who can adjourn. Um, so I just, since we're at an interim period, I would just throw that out. Yeah, one of the most confusing disclosures in a proxy is about postponement and adjournment, and that's a mistake where companies might even have inconsistent disclosure within the body of their proxy, one section to another. It might, you know, the cutting and pasting from the various years or from a with the exception of election of directors, I'm convinced that every proxy statement is getting looked at uh, by a plaintiff's lawyer somewhere. And we're having people sue on things like broker non-vote disclosure, adjournment disclosure. Uh, it's, it's, it's frightening. It really is. But just for your point, Brock, and you're exactly right, that people t uh, you know, will go from year to year and look at disclosure and maybe not kind of sync up what's on the agenda. So for 162M, for option plans, things like that, where broker non-votes might be different. And there's a 
couple of law firms and they're good at what they do. It's very annoying, um, but they're really zeroing in on that. So Kathy, what about the proxy card? What has to be disclosed about the virtual meeting on that? So the, the proxy card needs to say the location of the meeting. So if a meeting is going to be held virtually, it needs to say that. So again, it's going to be a question this year of whether a company will know in advance that they're doing a virtual meeting, and in which case, obviously, the proxy card will say that. Or if they switch midstream, in which case they don't need to, under the SEC guidance from last year, they don't need to update their proxy card. The press release that they issue will be sufficient for that purpose. But one thing I think that's important is making sure that your proxy card is consistent with your proxy. So make sure that they're the same, including with respect to adjournments, making sure that the items that are being voted upon are identical to what's in the proxy and that there's no unnecessary carryover if that's wrong. And one final note I'd say is I think it's really important if you know you're doing a virtual meeting with a proxy card to kind of flag for investors that it's important or for stockholders to maintain that control number because that control number is going to be important if they want to vote and they want to enter the virtual meeting. So I think the control number is taken on added importance in a virtual world that you really don't have in, in a physical meeting. Yeah, one piece of good news is that Broadridge has enhanced its abilities so that if a company is using a platform that's not Broadridge's this year, this upcoming season, they'll be able to quickly uh, let in um, shareholders into that other platform with a control number. Without last year, there it was a sort of a mechanical process. It took some time, and this year, it'll, it's it's streamlined. So uh, that's good news, and that Broadridge is working with other platforms to make sure it's sort of a seamless process. So what about um, another proxy disclosure, Kathy, the, the, the director attendance? What, what do companies have to disclose about directors attending if they're attending virtually, I guess, either by phone or... or um, so under item 407 of Reg SK, companies are required to disclose whether they have a policy about director attendance, and then they're required to disclose the number of directors that attended the prior year's meeting. The question we keep getting is if a director attended virtually you know, via the phone, whether that constitutes attendance for purposes of that disclosure requirement. There's no SEC guidance on what attendance means for this purpose, but I think generally speaking, absent there being something in a company's policy, which I haven't seen, that says a, you know, a director must attend in person or physically, um, most of them are silent. And in the event that there's you know, nothing, it just says attend. I think people will interpret that consistent with state law that um, you know, a director can attend virtually or um, you know, via telephone, and that constitutes attendance for purposes of state law. Can I add one thing there? Um, we, we have seen over the last, um, I guess, eight or nine months, um, some companies also amending their governance guidelines to make it very clear that attendance virtually counts um, for purposes of, you know, whatever, the, however the company has set up its attendance policy around directors. It's a great point. Yeah, I just taped a vid guide a few days ago about the corporate governance guidelines and the importance of looking at those annually to keep them fresh. You know, all the hot topics are covered, and that's a, a great point. That's something I actually hadn't thought of. What about um, a, other meeting participants attending virtually, carry the d inspector of elections, the independent auditors, the shareholder proponents? Is that legal to do that? Yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, for an inspector of elections, it's perfectly okay for them to attend virtually. If there's a hybrid meeting going on, so you have both an in-person component and a virtual component, um, you'll need to do a little logistics behind the scene to make sure that any ballots that are voted um, at the in-person meeting make their way to the inspector of elections um, as part of your process of, of tallying those votes. Um, and as it relates to auditors, it's perfectly okay for them to attend virtually as well. They typically don't get a lot of questions at um, annual meetings, but um, to the extent the company has a live line where it's um, letting its directors and officers participate so that they can answer stockholders' questions, um, it's good to give the auditors access to that line as well, just in case there is a question for the auditors during the meeting. And then shareholder proponents, um, it's also okay for them to attend virtually. Um, as you know, under the rules, uh, they have to um, they have to actually attend and, and um, either present their proposal or, or have a representative um, present the proposal on their behalf. Or um, the company has the ability to um, not submit the proposal for the meeting and and potentially can exclude. Um, 
proposals for the next two years if they, they have their sort of good cause for them not, not being there. Um, the SEC, as part of its COVID guidance, made clear that um, if a proponent can't attend because um, of coronavirus-related reasons, that that really wouldn't be good cause um, for excluding proposals in the future. And um, we've seen companies take some different approaches with shareholder proponents. Some will reach out and say, you know, you can present live, but you only have, you know, three minutes or two minutes or five minutes to present. And then um, other companies have let shareholder proponents record um, their proposals in advance to sort of mitigate the technical glitches that potentially can happen during a meeting. Um, and either one of those approaches is perfectly appropriate. Sometimes companies give proponents the option to go one way or the other. Um, one thing just to flag in terms of thinking about things going forward, um, there was some investor um, backlash at some companies that um, let shareholder proponents present their proposals, but then didn't really let them participate in any of the Q&A that related to their proposals. And so that's something that companies will need to think about this year if they're going to um, permit shareholder proponents to participate in that Q&A as part of just the general Q&A process. Yeah, obviously a company doesn't want to look like it has something to hide. So to the extent you can make it look as friendly as possible, you should do that, it would seem like. Mark, we talked about stockholder lists uh, at, at the top of the webcast. What exactly is required by Delaware law in those lists? So Section 219, uh, and, and, and I would add that people do still need to look at their bylaws because there are times when bylaws will have supplemental uh, provisions with respect to uh, shareholder lists. But Section 219 requires that the company make available to shareholders uh, 10 days in advance of the meeting a shareholder list um, listed in alphabetical order. We have found that most companies are still making the shareholder list available in advance of the meeting at corporate headquarters rather than posting them online. Uh, and then during the course of a virtual meeting, they do have to be available for inspection um, uh, kind of virtually as well. Uh, one thing we've noticed uh, because of the virtual nature of the stock list being online is that companies are becoming more sensitive to making sure that the at the home addresses or whatever their address is on the registered stock list for the company officers and the directors are now being changed to be corporate headquarters. So shareholders can certainly elect to designate that address as the appropriate address uh, because there were some instances in which um, uh, folks were taking advantage of the availability of the stock list to identify home addresses of uh, officers and directors. Yeah, that seems like a great point and use a small font as possible. <laughs> Kerry, what about F regulation FDR? One of my favorite topics. How do you ensure that your virtual annual meeting is, is FD compliant? So I guess the first thing as a threshold matter, um, you know, Reg FD does apply to an annual stockholders meeting just because the meeting is um, open and available to your stockholders doesn't mean that it's a Reg FD compliant forum, or at least it's typically not. Um, and so the same considerations that you would think about um, when you're thinking about an investor conference or a presentation um, would apply to the annual meeting as well. So um, making sure that someone is looking at the scripts and the presentations before they're given to make sure that um, everybody's staying within the four corners of the company's existing disclosure. Um, also, just making sure people understand that it's not a Reg FD compliant forum and that they shouldn't do things like um, confirm guidance or provide any updates uh, without thinking about whether to put out an AK um, either in advance or at the time of the annual meeting. Um, and so I think that those are sort of the things that, that I would think about, but it's really making sure that everyone's staying within the four corners of the, their existing. Thanks. And Kathy, what about the Q&A sessions this is probably the most important topic for this upcoming season, given the heightened sensitivity to the Q&A sessions? What's legally required, the length, how many questions to answer, are, are companies allowed to cherry pick? Yeah, so first, there's no express requirement. I mean, under state law, there's a requirement that, or you know, just generally speaking, that shareholders need to be given a reasonable opportunity to participate. So what does that mean? I think here it's worth pausing, and I addressed so many Q&A questions over the course of the past nine months. Um, Every company takes a different approach. I think it's important to recognize that one size does not fit all. You know, there's some companies that have 100 stockholders that would show up to their physical meeting. 
There's other companies where maybe they'd get one, you know, someone just strolling in for the breakfast. So it just really depends upon the audience. And I think that, you know, know your stockholders, know how you want to engage with them. And I think that will really dictate, you know, how to manage the Q&A. Let's just spend a couple minutes on what went wrong. I think over the past year, there was a lot of criticism. Um, you know, there were a lot of activist investors who wanted to you know, ask questions and they weren't given the opportunity either. Um, there are some meetings where they weren't permitted to attend at all, um, weren't permitted to ask questions, to even ask questions through a toolbox or a you know, chat box or something like that, or questions can be submitted in advance. But it was very ad hoc. I don't think it was clear. There were technical difficulties, and I really chalked that up to it was really the first time all of these companies were going during a virtual meeting. They hadn't planned or prepared for it. So things did, you know, in some instances didn't go as smoothly, and it certainly wasn't intentional. I think that now, with the benefit of a year, companies that do have a virtual meeting and when they know that they have investors who are interested in asking questions need to make sure it's very clear how they can participate and to think about a couple things. I think there's some best practices out there that have evolved and are probably out there before, but you know, weren't necessarily followed in 2020. And those include you know, being very clear who can ask questions and how. Um, consider you know, allowing people to ask questions in advance so people can submit them in writing. Committing to answer all questions that are appropriate. Obviously, some questions may not be appropriate and they don't need to answer that, or questions may not be appropriate for Reg D, as Carrie talked about. Um, you know, including the QA in the replay. Um, and having investors include their phone number and their name so that you don't have this anonymity of like a question was asked and it wasn't appropriate to answer, but you don't know who to get back to. So I think there's a lot that companies can do. Um, to balance the need for an orderly meeting and not spending an hour on Q&A to making sure that they're focused on being engaged and being responsive, but doing so in the confines of, you know, a limited period of time um, and, you know, limited constraints on their ability to answer questions. And, and getting back to Mark's point earlier about proxy disclosure lawsuits, it's important, I think, to clear what your Q&A process is going to be with the board chair, with the CEO, other senior managers and directors, to ensure that what you disclose, you don't want to disclose something like these are best practices, we're going to do that. And then right before the meeting, have mm -hmm. someone say, <laughs> a senior to you that, no, we're not going to be doing that um, because you have the risk then of a proxy disclosure lawsuit yeah. for sure. Maybe just adding a point to that, Brock. So one of the questions that I was asked was, should we post Q&A on our website or should we say in the press release that we'll make Q&A available after? And there's a lot of tension of Company saying, I don't want to commit to that because what if like, we just get silly questions and then someone sues us because we didn't post everything and they asked a question and so there's some discretion involved here. So I think each company will need to look at kind of what questions did they receive last year and on the basis of that, you know, make a determination whether they want to proceed with committing to do something like that. But I do think there's some skepticism about whether or not that's going to be appropriate and whether or not that poses litigation risk for them down the road. Right. And you might not commit to do it beforehand, but once you get the questions and you find out these are good questions for everyone to see in written form, perhaps, then we'll post them. Microsoft's one company I can think of that I believe posts, you know, at least a subsection of their questions afterwards. Carrie, what about legal issues with pre-recording a presentation from the CEO or a business presentation? Are there any legal issues? really think so. I think that, um, you know, generally that's an, a perfectly okay practice. Um, obviously, you've got to keep Reg FD in mind when you're recording um, a presentation in advance as well. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, there's a little bit of a balance, obviously, between um, the timing of recording the presentation and then if there are events that occur after that, um, you know, that maybe the CEO would have wanted to discuss you know, do you have to re-record? So I think there's, it's a little bit of logistical coordination, I think, um, in terms of just the timing of, of pre-recording anything. But to be clear, the entire meeting cannot be pre-recorded. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> right, this is just the, the presentation about strategy, the business, um, a way for the company to show off, you know, what is- State it's of the been, business kind of stuff. Doing. Exactly, yeah. So how might you distribute a rules of conduct, Kathy? So there's several different ways that you can distribute um, the rules of conduct. The first would be to um, post on your website so that stockholders can see it in advance of the meeting. Um, you can reference it in your proxy materials um, or the press release. Um, what a lot of companies did is they posted on the landing page for the virtual meeting 
so that when a stockholder logged on, you know, they saw the rules of conduct there. And then fourth, like a physical meeting, I think it's important for the chair before the official business begins to go through what those rules are, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, and particularly with respect to the scope of Q&A and you know, make sure it's clear that those will relate to questions that are germane. To the and then Mark, what about possible legal ramifications for a technological glitch during the meeting? You know, this gets sort of to the whole postponement or adjourning of the meeting, perhaps, if the glitch is that big. Under the rubric of technological glitches, there is also the possibility of concerted action by third parties in an attempt to disrupt the meeting uh, from a technological perspective. There is a difference under Delaware law between a postponement and adjournment, and they are, they are important differences. And this, again, could go back to making sure that there's nothing in the bylaws that would uh, have an impact on this, this one way or another. A postponement, and, and this is the intersection of the proxy disclosure, the proxy card, and then, and then what actually is happening. So we do strongly recommend, as I think um, uh, both Carrie and Kathy have indicated, that the proxy uh, statement indicate uh, the, the power to adjourn and or postpone, and the proxy card actually contain language uh, that permits the proxy to continue to be valid at a, an adjournment or postponement uh, of the meeting. Um, a postponement does mean that the meeting was not convened, and while it is, uh, it is possible that we could save the record date, we would need a new notice of meeting to go out, and whether that fits within the 60-10 day um, notice window as required by Delaware law, people would have to look at and be cognizant of. With respect to an adjournment, uh, the adjournment would mean that you're actually convening the meeting so that without regard to the technological glitch, the meeting actually was able to uh, open up from a technological perspective that would permit actually the, uh, the possibility of an adjournment. Uh, some companies have gone to uh, a disclosure in the proxy statement that in the event that the company was not able to convene, there would be you know, literally in the notice, here's, where, here's how and when we will reconvene. Uh, others have commenced at the beginning um, of the meeting an announcement that, you know, in the event that there is a technological glitch, you know, we intend, to, and that then that would mean the meeting actually has convened, and so it would be likely more an adjournment than a postponement. Um, and here is our proposal with respect to when we will reconvene at the adjourned meeting. Um, there are equitable constraints historically. Uh, with respect to adjournment and postponement, and those have to be uh, with respect to how the vote is going, uh, if the vote is being, you know, kind of manipulated, if you will, and, and as a result, uh, people are adjourning or postponing. Uh, we do tend to look at the virtual context like you would do a, uh, an in-person meeting. So, you know, if you're at an in-person meeting and somebody pulled the fire alarm and everyone had to vacate the premises, you know, that would be kind of an uh, analogous situation with respect to a technological problem. Um, we do recommend that in advance of the meeting, um, all board members be a, you know, at a place where if they, if they were required to reconvene, uh, you know, first get the board together and get the as blessing, if not of the full board members, but as of many directors as you can. And this is especially important, I think, with respect to outside directors, because you do want to create a record that, um, we do recommend that companies have prepared uh, perhaps a, um, a dial-in number for the directors to convene the board in the event that a decision needs to be made with respect to adjournment or postponement, uh, just to make sure you have ready access to um, a duly called board meeting to make the decision. That is something that the courts have looked at in interpreting conduct surrounding an adjournment or postponement uh, of, of a meeting. With respect to the adjournment, and again, this is different from postponement, um, the meeting is duly convened, and so the record date is preserved, and they can adjourn without a new notice if it's if it's up for thirty uh, up to thirty days. Uh, and these are calendar days, and a new record date has not been set. Um, it has also been possible, and this has happened this year, where there have been um, successive uh, uh, adjournments as well. But these are all things that they have to be prepared for in advance to have a script, if you will, ready to go in the event that a technological issue were to arise. Um, one important aspect, and this does get back to the bylaws, is who has the authority to adjourn. Um, and you know, we strongly advocate that people 
look at making sure that the chair, if possible, be vested with the authority to make the determination unilaterally, if necessarily, uh, to adjourn the meeting. That's great. I mean, this is such important information that a lot of us out here who are federal securities law, corporate law, uh, we're not well versed in state law. And, and I know, like I said earlier, that postponement and adjournment trip people up all the time. And it's not until you get in to hot water that you learn what you need to know. So thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Carrie, before we turn to this last item, I want to, if you don't mind, to talk, spend a second on the handbook that you and your colleagues at Covington just updated that, I, that you did in combination with Broadridge. It's such a, a great reference tool for those of you facing virtual meetings this year. Uh, how, how big did it grow this, this year? Sure, sure. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's, you know, 20-ish or so pages. Um, it's just a guide on, on virtual meetings that we did in connection with Broadridge, and um, we put it out uh, in time for last year's annual meeting season, and then we updated it again um, in the fall. And if there, we might update it one more time again before um, before proxy season starts. But it's it's meant to be sort of a practical, hands-on resource um, for in-house in-house folks who are sort of thinking about how to navigate um, some of the virtual stockholder meeting issues that, particularly those that came up last year. So, great, yeah, it's a great tool. So what happens if the U.S. Post Office, which does happen, or Broadridge has issues so that shareholders are complaining that they're not receiving their materials on time in, in, in the mail? Does a company need to postpone its meeting? So it's a great question, and I think it's, it, it's really facts and circumstances dependent. Um, I mean, there was some staff guidance last year. Um, it happened with um, a couple of companies that particularly that were thinking about doing full set delivery where um, either there were delays in printing or delays because of the postal service because of COVID um, or they wanted to switch um, at the last minute to, um, to notice and access. Um, and the SEC at least said, you know, that they wouldn't object to using notice only and, and maybe not completely complying with um, you know, the 40 day and, and the other requirements, as long as stockholders um, had the material sufficiently in advance and um, had the ability to review them and, and exercise their voting rights. And I think that that's really the key question, you know, if, if, um, if stockholders have the ability to review the materials and, and to vote either as part of the meeting or advance and can make an informed decision, I think that that should really guide um, whether or not the meeting needs to be postponed. Yeah, and to the extent that the post office continues to go downhill, pandemic or not, you know, we'll see. I think more and more companies move away to the extent, I'm surprised, I mean, are still doing full set, but some companies are. Uh, but it's just dicey to, to be relying on that as, as, a, as a tool to get delivery. So I want to thank Carrie, Kathy, and Mark for a wonderful presentation. Everything you wanted to know legally about virtual annual, annual meetings, but we're afraid to to learn about, I guess, not to ask. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.